And every time I'd bring the church up, there was a lot of fights. And back in my head, I always thought, man, would my wife leave me over a church? Here's what I want you to do. And she handed me this list. Number one was, I needed to submit to the spiritual authority of JJ, the pastor of the church. And Britt threatened, she said, if you don't do these things, it's gonna get a lot worse for you. Every day I worried about what actually ended up happening. And that was, that was when I walked through my front door and there was a, a letter on my counter that said, don't forget to feed the cats. My kids were gone, she was gone. I missed, I missed their birthdays mm -hmm. and Christmas and New Year's. And uh, that was the hardest part of my life. Back to U-Haul up right into the yard. There was tracks for the U-Haul. They took her dressers and, and dumped all of my clothes right on the floor. And when I got home, uh, everything was out of my house. I, I had one plate, they left me a plate, which was nice. Wow, yeah. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Realist People in Real Estate podcast, where we talk about the real shit and not about real estate. I'm one of your hosts, Brooke Jones, aka The Millennial Agent. What's up, guys? It's your girl, Tyra Nicole. And I am Nicole Pay, and today we have someone pretty awesome. I'm just going to say that. Uh, podcast host of Free For All Fridays, father of four boys, and a real estate coach for, I'm going to let you put, how many, how many? Yeah, 14 years now. Going 14 on. years now. Mr. Johnny Awesome. Yes, thank you, guys. Thank you so much Welcome. for him. coming and joining us. We're so excited to have you with us. And really quick, I just want to do, we talked about this off, your credentials. So, you said how many teams did you have under your coaching? Yeah, so right now in my database, I have 22 mega teams. Uh, I have over 1,900 agents in there, and most of them I've I've talked to at least once. Agents are finicky people, so you know it's <laughs> it's funny because you can get them on the phone one time, but that second, third time. But I, I work with a lot of agents all over the nation. Uh, I've been uh, blessed to be able to do that um, and really use my talent to help folks and. Uh, now that I know when, where we're at in the podcast <laughs> world, too, uh, I've also had the exciting ability. This will be the first time I've announced this. Can I jump right into news? Yes, yeah, sorry, let's do I, it. I, let's I don't know. Let's hear it. I don't Listen. know. I'll jump do right into news. Do we need a news. drum roll? Drum roll? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Jimmy Fantastic, of course, you guys, uh, my host for Free For All Friday, yeah. uh, which you guys were on and, and was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Jimmy Fantastic and I got together a while ago and started saying, what if we also launched our own coaching platform? Amazing. And so uh, we launched something called 3535.org. We partnered up with our uh, friend, uh, Scott Muska, who is just a great business guru. Everybody knows his name everywhere we go. He, uh, he is a... He could get into businesses and tweak them. The last business he tweaked was a technology company and they ended up selling for $200 million oh, on wow. the stock market, right? So yeah, we said, wow. what if we took that knowledge and brought it to the average everyday realtor mm -hmm. and helped them tweak their business as if they owned a business? Because guess what, guys? Realtors do own businesses. Well, yeah, you're your own business. So we, we had that idea. We launched it. We're super excited. We're in that early phase right now where we, where we pre-launched and we're getting uh, asked to come out to places. We're being uh, taken out to Tennessee. We're being flown out to New Mexico. And we're just getting rolling. So, oh, so when excited. this airs... April 15th, is, April. That, is that what you were talking about? Yeah, that's what I was talking okay, about. So Nobody April, knows this. this so is, April 15th, when yeah. this airs, this is breaking news. This is breaking news. Johnny Awesome has announced. There it is. So there, you guys are seeing this live. Well, not <laughs> live, but first. First. Yeah. Yeah. First on yeah. April 15th. First. That's awesome. so good. That's yeah. Yeah. Congratulations that's awesome. to Thank you both. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. I yeah. pray that it brings you guys tons of success. And Thank like, you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, isn't it isn't it kind of odd, though? Like, we were on Free For All Fridays, what? Two, three, three weeks ago, or whatever, maybe a little bit four weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're on the opposite end. Yeah. Like, how, does it feel? how does that feel? How does that feel? I was telling Brooke in the elevator, I'm, I'm super nervous to be here. Really? Really? Yes. Isn't that surprised? Like, Very. for two different reasons. Number one, on my show, like, it's it's my show, and I'm talking about everybody else. Yeah. But on this show, Your like, turn. you guys are talking about me, yeah. and there's all these cameras, and people are like, <laughs> is this in his face, and this guy's taking my gum in his hand, and I'm like, I don't it's do a well, whole take, different he's world. He's so used to it. He's so used to it. He just takes all of our gum. We're like, well, we need a gum check. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's super awesome. And, and 
I will say, let's. I said super awesome, and I do kind of want to talk about it. your actual legal name is Johnny Awesome, correct? Really? Yeah, yeah. You didn't know that. He's, he, not. So you left when we oh, talked about yeah. it, but he uh, changed his name. His legal name is actually Johnny Awesome now. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're gonna. I'm sure. <laughs> If not, you already have an awesome life. You're yeah. going to definitely have an awesome life yeah. if that's your name. Yeah. No, that is. <laughs> you say if that is who you if really are. That's who you claim no, to be. That's yeah. who they say I am. Yeah. Yeah. You guys want to hear that story? I, I, I want to hear it. Do you guys want to hear the origin add. story? I think yeah. it goes with the whole I, I was gonna say, story. I think we, us knowing a little bit of your background story, yeah. which we mm -hmm. love to dive into, I think the whole Johnny Awesome thing like Brooke just said, it goes with the whole dynamic of how you got to Johnny Awesome. Yeah. And we usually talk about hot topics, and I think we kind of said that we were going to... He's gonna, a hot topic. You are a hot topic. So. And, and we're going <laughs> to dive right into it because you have one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard in my mm -hmm. life. And I left the day that we had talked at Free For All uh, completely touched by where you're at and where you've come and everything you've been through. So... I don't know if you want to start from the beginning. Oh, man. I, we might as well, guys. Let's rip the Band-Aid off, I just, right? Just do it. And we're, then there's no pouring salt on the moon. Like, yeah. we're going to rip the Band-Aid off, and we're going to get straight from the beginning, because I, yeah. I, I agree with Brooke. I think Johnny Awesome goes with everything. Everything. Yeah. 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 So. So, I guess, uh, I, I don't, I, I set this up by saying my life is kind of a trigger warning, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, we're going to start with the trigger we'll warning. We'll start with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, was, uh, I was going to be born as Craig Tuttle. So, uh, to add on to the story, if we can start from the beginning. Yeah, yeah that's um, what we want. My, uh, my birth mom became pregnant with me when she was 12 years old. Wow. And that's very super young. And um, my birth dad was 13 going on 14. And so, the decision had to be made of, well, what to do with that. And um, my birth mom was on the fence of whether or not uh, she should go with an abortion or whether or not she should go through with adoption. My dad was very much adoption, 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 and they were supposed to meet, and um, the, the day that they were supposed to meet, he stole his dad's car and started to drive in Grand Rapids to meet with her for, for breakfast just to convince her one last time before, before my appointment, and the car broke down. A huge storm started and he ran from one side of Grand Rapids to the clinic where she was at and he burst through the front door and he started looking and yelling everywhere for her and when she knew what he had just done, luckily the doctor was running late for my appointment because she decided if he had that much, you know, if he was that much against it, she should really rethink it and so she decided to walk out and then decided to give me up for adoption. Wow. Mm. So when that happened, I, uh, I was adopted by a couple and in Midland. I, and, and luckily, I was adopted right away. So I was only in the uh, orphanage for three months before I was picked up. I was picked up uh, by my mom. If, if you're adopted, you know this. You call your, yeah. you know, your birth parents, no, birth parents, your and your parents. mom. Yeah. So my mom is my mom. She's the one that adopted me and my dad. And they gave me the name John Milo Bryant. Now, most people don't know this. I, I didn't tell anybody my middle name <laughs> forever because Milo sucks as a middle name when you're a kid. Milo? So you guys Why? See that now, I like that. I know a little when, boy named Milo. Yeah, yeah. So Why when, does it suck? Well, when I, I was a little kid, Milo and Otis was a thing. And oh, I remember. Kids suck. And yeah. so everybody makes fun of you for any reason that they can. And who yeah. knows why? Milo and Otis, that reference was insulting Wasn't for some reason. Wasn't that a cat and dog story? Yeah. yeah. It's I a movie that I've never cool. seen and I've never, never it's watched it. a great it. movie. Well, I just, I'm it's just angry movie. at it. Why? I've never heard of it. <laughs> just, you've never seen Milo and Otis? Oh, no. good movie. It sounds cute. Yeah. No, definitely see Milo and Otis. <laughs> yeah. Very cute. And yeah, that's crazy though, because that was actually a really cute movie. Yeah, and you know, like I said, I think that kids have a way of making fun of you in a way where even if there isn't anything wrong with it, kids can pick at it enough to make you feel like it. To find something. And what's crazy about that is we take that baggage and we carry that into us as we become adults. And now you've got people that don't know why they are the way they are, why a phone call at dinner time makes them all anxious. Or, mm -hmm. you know, it's just weird how we do that. But um, I always hated my middle name. And it was around the preteen age, I really didn't, uh, didn't get along with my dad very well. Um, and so I. I didn't really want to carry on that Brian's last name. I was starting to become a young teenager and a man of my own. And I'm like, man, 
I kind of want my own my own name. Mm-hmm. So in the seventh grade, out of nowhere, I just decided to call myself Bob Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> it made sense to me. Uh, and Wait, that, like, where did that? Yeah, that, where did that is come there from? any correlation, or like, where would that have come from? <laughs> okay, or do you want to tell nobody us? Nobody knows uh, this. This is the stuff nobody has ever known, which well, is crazy. We're finding it out. Yeah. Uh, there was the first like high, mid high school when you start to, when you know when you finally hit that age uh, <laughs> crush that I had was on a girl named Carrie Stevens. And, oh, there's the Stevens. Yes. It all makes sense. And then my mom had just, uh, had either just divorced my dad or, no, she had been divorced from my dad by this time. And she, she was hanging out with a guy named Bob, who was a really cool dude. And because I didn't really have a good relationship with my dad, I was always seeking a relationship mm-hmm. with a dude that, like, nobody ever threw a football with me, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. that never happened. Nobody just took me out to a park and played and said, way mm-hmm. to go, son. Right. So I was always kind of looking for that. And this this guy was kind of like that. He was masculine. He's kind of cool. So I just put the two things together one day, and I was <laughs> like, I'm Bob Stevens now. <laughs> and the crazy part about all this is when Gmail first started coming out and, and the Internet, and back when I was a kid, you don't use your real name online. Right. You use Bob Stevens, right? You use your alias. Mm-hmm. To this day, every now and then, I'll still get a piece of mail as Bob <laughs> Stevens. Bob Stevens? <laughs> which is crazy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and so, so then from there, um, unfortunately, Bob Stevens didn't transfer. Like, the teachers wouldn't call me that. They knew who I really was. <laughs> But when I went, didn't work. Yeah, the transcripts didn't work. <laughs> but something happened between middle school and high school where my full name didn't transfer over. They they somehow ended up missing my middle name, mm. which was great. Right, right. And I had this English teacher, Mr. Wilson, and he said, <laughs> Mr. Well, Mr. Wilson, Wilson. Wilson. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. <laughs> I thought you might be too. Uh, I know. She knows all the Listen, we do all we do movie stuff all the time. Too. I was so excited you for a minute. Really I was excited. like, "Do you know him?" Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know Mr. Wilson. <laughs> you know what's really funny? I think your Mr. Wilson's different than my Mr. Wilson because my Probably Mr. Wilson was Are behind this? a fence. Oh, yes. oh, oh improvement. Oh, that Mr. Wilson. I know that one. Another one. Yeah. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. that was that. He, a lot of Mr. Wilson. Yeah, sometimes there you say, yeah. Mr. Mr. Wilson. He's like, <laughs> Yeah. You know, that was, that was, that was uh, Tim Allen did that. Yeah. 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 So neither so of those. So you're Mr. Wilson. Yeah. So the teacher, Mr. Wilson. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, he was kind of a smart guy. He's my English teacher. And, and he's the one that said, so what's your middle name? And I said, Bob. <laughs> he goes, oh, John Bob. John Bob. Yeah, and that was the birth of John, John Bob. Bob. So all throughout my school year, I was John Bob. And I dropped my last name completely. I didn't tell people what it was. I was just John Bob. So, but wait, like, everybody knows everyone's last name in school? Like, how did you... How? Only if somebody tells you. Yearbooks. Oh, well, yeah, it's, that's true. But again, you know, the, like, how you know you, people. Did you sign John Bob on like your everything. school papers? It was, it was my driver's <laughs> license on the back of my car. No way. No way. My email address to this day is the John Bob at gmail.com. Wait, how is it on your, your driver's license? Oh, I'm sorry, not driver's license. Oh. It was on my your license plate. I- my oh. license plate. Oh, okay. Yeah, what yeah. about like your school ID? Did they have school So we didn't have those back then? Oh, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't yeah, a thing. Yeah, we didn't, I say we didn't really yeah. either. Yeah, so. Well, I didn't tell college. Okay, so. Going back to the adoption, did you have like a closed adoption, open adoption? Yes, no, it was closed. I didn't meet my birth parents until a lot, lot later. Oh, okay. so there's more to the story. Wait oh, for yeah. it. Wait, yeah. wait for it. Yeah. Okay. okay. I can go into that. And then too. your parents' relationship, I'm assuming, wasn't that great growing up. In, in the yeah yeah the the my dad always blamed me for him not going to school for some reason because my mom wanted a kid real bad. She was told she couldn't have any. So were she decided young? to adopt. What were, was they, that? were they young? I was, uh, but my mom's told me she was 31 every year. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how old okay, she I'm is. 36 <laughs> right. every year, so it doesn't matter. I know she. I, I mean, go, go to school for what, college? Or? For, for my dad was, yeah. That's what he college. wanted to go. But instead of doing that, I think, I think my mom was older, and that's why she was afraid that she was never going to be able to have kids. Oh. So to adopt, you know, that's what they decided to do. And by doing that, my dad never really worked. He, uh, he, I don't know what he was. Um, <laughs> he, he was he, Tommy Tom Tom Martin. Yeah. How did you know? I love it. <laughs> you know him? No, I don't know. Just 
Tommy. Tommy from Martin. Do you know Tommy from Martin? No. Oh, no. my God. He never, he we're not even going to get into these that. These two. I know yeah. what you guys are talking about. Yeah. But because you never knew what Tommy from Martin did for a living. He just had it all. He yeah, was. well, we were like that, but without the all. Like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we, were, we weren't really rich. Um, but because of that, my mom, she was the one that always had to work to support the family because he wouldn't, you know. So, um, it, it, yeah, so when they, when they got divorced... Um, there was there was a lot of things there was there was some abuse that was happening in the household that finally pushed her over the edge uh, especially with me and uh, when that when that all happened it was funny because when that happened I went to uh, the day that she told me that was happening I was like hey do you need help packing your stuff <laughs> like I was a lady uh, we have a no. divorce party yes, yes. <laughs> but, so just but, to clarify sorry, so yeah. you're fine you're no, Alex, and I don't know if you want to answer this so were you being abused as well is that what you're saying I, I was the abuse yeah. Oh. yeah 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 not 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 like what people just I guess I'll just throw it out there so people don't think it's he he was very uh, verbally but um, every now and then he would fly off the handle and, and he'd throw an arm around my throat or something like that and yeah. it wasn't it wasn't often and uh, through a lot of um, through a lot of my own coaching uh, with with uh, with some great coaches I've been able to work through that and look at his life and um, there's an awesome awesome book out there um, man I'm gonna I'm forgetting the name but uh, it'll come to you the power of performance I believe is the name of it mm -hmm. but it in the book it talks about how we all have stories and then we have facts and what we need to do sometimes is really figure out and take the story away and just get down to the fact of things and then we can change the story and we can start to live better lives. With my dad, I lived so long in anger and I was mad and I was, like I said, I was, I was always blamed for a lot of things and his way of communicating, um, because he's insecure, his way of communicating with me my entire life made me feel like not only was I insignificant, but man, I should have just been aborted. You know, that's mm -hmm. how he made me feel. And um, I, it took a long time to work through that. And when I did, I'm glad that I did because I was actually able to then start to have conversations with my dad long, 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 long time after. I mean, I'm talking the last couple of years. It took a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And then he started telling me things that I never knew. Hmm. And when that started happening, like when we were just having this conversation, he told me at 12 years old, he had a knife to his father's chest. And... He says it like it doesn't matter like because he, like he doesn't it's realize. Yeah, yeah, he didn't realize how much that messed him up. But at, at 12 years old, my grandfather was an alcoholic. My dad never drank, but he had all the characteristics of one that did mm -hmm. because this is learned behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. My grandfather would go drink a lot. And he'd come home and he would beat on my grandma and violently, really bad. And one night, it was really, really bad. And my dad took a kitchen knife and put it into my grandpa's chest and said, if he comes any closer and never does it again, he'll kill him. And without even like blinking, he just said, I think that's the night that my relationship went downhill with my father. You think? <laughs> yeah. It, like, I, it, it probably was long before that, but that but was to get the to that camp point. to get mm -hmm. to that point. Like the relationship was destroyed long before that. But So I told that, like I was telling my mom that and she was like, Man, I never I never knew that. And I'm like, Yeah, Dad has these crazy stories but he never worked through any of those and because of that he didn't really know how to handle you know a kid and I, I think that you know again when you go back to fact and story because because I started seeing things from that point of view I could I was no longer angry mm -hmm. it doesn't give it doesn't like give him a free pass justify what happened yeah yeah but what it does do is it allows me to put myself in his feet for a second and realize here's a hurting people or their people here's mm -hmm. here's a hurting man because hurting people do hurt people hurt people, yeah. hurt people hurt. that is right? so yeah. true so true and yeah if I continued to have that hurt inside of me as well that never does any good because holding grudges is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Yeah. Hmm, where have you heard that before? What is this? I, <laughs> yeah, where? <laughs> Mr. Wilson! <laughs> I, I literally say that all the time. Like, it's something that I tell my kids. It's something mm. that I've said to Will before. It's something that it was ingrained in me. Like, yeah. when you allow someone else to control you that much, it's like you're drinking the poison, but you want the, the damage to come to yeah. that person, and it's not going to happen. It you're never. only damaging yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so because of that relationship early on, that was the real reason I never wanted to carry that last name on. 
So when I got the opportunity to change it, I just I was changing. Now later on, I learned that this is actually frequently happens with adopted kids too, especially when we're adopted real young. We are trying to find our own identity. Mm-hmm. We're trying to come up with who we really are, and so it, it happens a lot. But with me, there was this notion of I just didn't want to carry that family name on. So. So I, I actually lived as John Bob for quite some time in different <laughs> professions, and I had a multiple. Like as mar- adulthood? Oh yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh, that was it was everybody. There people to this days will still call me John Bob. That are like I used to be in a business profession. We'd wear suit and ties, and people would just call me John Bob. It's just who I was. It was easy for them to wow. say. And um, it's really weird to connect with people from back in the day because they don't know what to call me anymore. <laughs> They're just like, John Bob, Bob, Steve, awesome, I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> Mr. Awesome. When, when I got, so then there was this transition in my life. Now I'm like in my 21-ish is, um, and I started to get into radio. Mm-hmm. And I had the opportunity to be on a couple of different radio stations. Um, I had the opportunity to entertain, and, and as John Bob, that didn't work well on radio that wasn't country. And I'm not a country guy, right? <laughs> right. So being on, you know, being on a top 20 station as John Bob, it just didn't fit that well. When I had the opportunity to apply for Sorry. a night show on radio. Sorry. You good? <laughs> My ear was uh, itching. Oh. oh, it's the worst. <laughs> That's never happened. But It's never? Your ear has never itched before no, not, in your life? No, not during this podcast oh. with these headphones. <laughs> I was going to say, that's amazing. I'm like, she's like, what is here, this like, feeling? Trying to keep myself composed. <laughs> we're just a hot mess. And my, my earrings are all smashed. And I'm like, oh. yeah, we're just all a hot mess over here. <laughs> you, you guys want to hear a crazy story? Because I know this gets edited. I don't know. You guys can feel free to leave this in. Uh, and put it wherever. I would say pretty much everything is going to be left. In. Put it, put it wherever you want to put it in the right, story. Okay. This is what I didn't tell you in the elevator, and I and I almost don't want to say this. It's super hard for me to be vulnerable. It's one of the reasons why it's really hard. The subject that I'm going to come up on and start talking about, I this these last two years have been very difficult, and for about a year of it, my morning routine was to wake up every morning early in the morning, sick to my stomach, and throw up nonstop. On purpose. Or no, just because I, it just I, I was, was happening. under so much stress. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to a doctor about it. He says, everybody handles stress different. And the amount of stress you're under is, is so crazy. So I haven't had to deal with this stuff in so long. One of the reasons I was so late to this podcast was because I started throwing up real bad to get out here. No way. Because wow. I'm so worked up about what I'm about to share that mm-hmm. I it makes me not it makes me sick. So well, I only, we don't, we I only don't say that to make you uncomfortable. No, it's like, fine. It means well, it's, it's part space. of the healing process. Yeah. And I think um, eventually it's gonna and I, I I'm glad that this is the platform because, you know, I love Robert and I love what you guys are doing and I love the fact that you're getting to the story behind the people. Mm-hmm. And so I I I've talked to my therapist and you know, I think it's it's time. You know what I mean? It's yeah. time for mm-hmm. me to start opening up on this stuff because then I can start to not only heal, yeah. but now my story doesn't go to waste. Because there's a lot of people, like you guys said when you were on a podcast, that like they don't understand their situation isn't hopeless right now. Right. And if they hear a situation where it really does sound hopeless, it gives different perspective. Mm-hmm. Right? So wherever that goes in, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I'm glad your ear itches. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Maybe that's why my ear itches. Maybe that's itch. why. I'm, I'm ready to hear. Yeah, yeah. You're ready to hear. Get it all out of there. So, it's coming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so se- like I don't want to say segueing into it because it is it is a really really because we're in your 20s and now where you're at the stage of your life like yeah, a so lot of stuff there, has yeah. happened yeah. in between that and for me. Number one, your relationship with your dad, like where are you at now? Like, are you guys, Yeah. Where, uh, is it coming to? So it's, it's. I have completely forgiven him. Um, one of the conversations I had to have though, and this is something that we have to sometimes ask ourselves, if the person that we have in our life is not building us, but tearing us down constantly, even if we love them, do we keep them in our lives? Absolutely not. Absolutely. <laughs> I was just about to say, absolutely not, but then my my husband chimed in real quick, because this is a conversation that we have in my life. Absolutely. It's very much a... But it's hard, isn't it? It's a very difficult thing. And especially, you know, 
I'm, I'm fully believe in forgiveness, but you know, forgiveness doesn't mean that you allow, if somebody stabs you and they say that they're sorry and you have forgiven them, but they continue to do it, eventually you have to just be like, man, we can't be in the same place, mm-hmm. you know? Johnny, you are. Oh gosh, you. how did I know? <laughs> I was waiting. You're gonna be I like mean, the that's, topic that's of our this, conversation on the way home. But, it, it's something that I, but it, but it, it's, it's a, a struggle building. for me. Well, no, no, it's not even just for you because me knowing a whole lot of people that allow that to continuously happen. Yeah. And you it, making a statement from that and then living by it is like, what everybody needs to do everybody can know that they need to fix it yeah but when you fix it personally knowing that it's hard that's that's i give kudos mm-hmm. for sure. yeah yeah because we're attached to those people that are it's, hurting us well and, and it's you know i feel for people too because he's you gotta remember he's also the grandfather of my four kids right exactly so i let him communicate with them and i make sure they send him videos and thank yous you know and um i, I let i let that happen but for for our communication um, at this point today, it's a no. Now, if there's a point where he can have a normal conversation, mm. and, uh, and and it's just about boundaries at that point in time, I, I, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to my dad. Mm-hmm. Who doesn't want to talk to your dad? dad? Yeah. yeah. But if you start going down these roads, then the conversation's over, and we'll try again in six months. But the, but the roads being the same behavior. The same right? behavior, the same, uh, you know, just the things that he would say. And the, most of them, again, go back to his own insecurities, things that he wasn't able to accomplish in his life. And then he turns them out and around on me like, yeah. 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 And those are incredibly bad. healthy boundaries. And, again, it's not easy. And I give you incredible kudos like Will did because... It, it's not like we can sit here and say it's easy to set boundaries, especially healthy ones. Yeah. Um, and it's it's not it's really when we especially when we get older. Yeah. Um, and you're, you know, for me, like my parents are getting older and I'm yearning for a relationship that I just am not going to have. Yeah. So I have to start setting those boundaries. So I, I definitely commend you. So moving forward, yeah, um, you know your relationship is where you at. Where you're at. Where did you go into your? How, how do we 20s? get from John Bob to Johnny Austin? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I had the opportunity to um, apply for a for a, a radio show. Uh, I actually I actually won this, but they wanted to give it to somebody else. So they gave me a night nice <laughs> show what do you mean you won it? I don't. Okay, so there's this, there this competition <laughs> this radio station had, and this competition, uh, this competition that they had, you had to create a show, and I knew that I couldn't go into it with the type of music it was, being John Bob. So I created a new <laughs> character in my life that I went for for by a while, and that was Johnny Big. Okay. And the show I created was the Big Show with Johnny Big. So I created all the prod behind it. And you guys have been on my show. I mean, yeah. that, you, you know what I can do. So I created everything behind it and submitted it in. And listeners voted. And I actually won. I didn't learn this until after I started working at the station. But they, they, wanted, to give, they wanted to give the morning show to a female host. So they gave it to a female host instead. Mm. Because they had had a male host. So what they did offer me, however, was my own night show. So I had what was known as the Big Show. Now, you guys want to hear something really crazy? Yeah. This is something people don't know either. Free For All Friday is a rendition of my old show. Oh. No way. Okay. So what would happen oh, is... What, but did you, have a, did you have a Jimmy Nelson with you, or was it just... No, you? I wish I would have, man. Would have. <laughs> so what I did was every Friday... So our, my show was not... I didn't have to do it live. But every Friday I did. Most, most here's some. I'm going to break some radio news for you. Uh, most of the late night guys, even your morning show guys, they pre-record at least the first two hours because nobody wakes up on time. <laughs> but I was crazy, and I loved the. I loved it, right? So every Friday night was the Friday night big show live, <laughs> and we went live at ten o'clock. The doors were open to the radio station, and anybody could walk in off the street wow. and sit in my studio How and talk. Get to that me. approved with? I did it. <laughs> I'm, it probably was a different time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you had some like, crazy how did you get that The station was also in the, station. Uh, the station was in Coleman, Michigan, as well. Oh, so well, I, wasn't I don't even know where that, exactly. where's that even at. <laughs> so I, it wasn't like a lot of crazy okay. people. But anytime we had bands come through, um, they loved it because we would do cr- just crazy things. Hmm. So like um, what? what's that? Like, like what? what? Oh, she doesn't know crazy things. Yeah, like that. yeah. One time, I don't know. I think the craziest thing we ever did is we somebody was talking about how 
their shoe could murder somebody. Why? So we, we didn't have any protective headgear. So we took a lampshade and we put it on this band member's head. I don't remember which band this was. <laughs> but we put it on their head and we all just start chucking shoes at his face. What? Uh, this is the type How is that not a, like a lawsuit in the making? Like, didn't the Listen, station. This is a on. different time. <laughs> this is a different time. But people love being on the show. Nowadays, you'd be like, um, where's my lawyer? <laughs> well, but he allowed us to do it. Yeah. So, you okay, know, yeah, okay, that's yeah, fair. fair we, didn't, we didn't just start throwing shoes at him. just start throwing shoes at him like, me. So, <laughs> so, how did that go? Yeah, how'd that work just out for you? Throwing yeah, shoes. Yeah, it was good. Was it, was, it was a great bit. People thought it was funny. I, I used to record and put stuff on... Well, we were developing our own website. This is back when Tom Green used to do that, before YouTube was a thing. And so that's what we were doing. I don't know where any of those old videos are, but it was a lot of fun. And yeah. In a three-month period of time, that show got so popular, that, and the morning show kind of didn't, that they uh, flipped me. So they gave me the morning, morning show. They gave you the morning show. So I ended up with the big show, <laughs> which was now in the mornings. And then I got a co-host, Sarah the Intern. And, uh, and we ran that for quite some time. Wait. Sarah the intern, like she wasn't ninety five five. Sarah the intern. No, okay. I don't think so. Because there was a, there was a Sarah the intern on ninety five five. Yeah, no. That's literally what they called her, Sarah the intern. Well, that's literally what we called. Did we call her? <laughs> what? How long ago was this for you? Gosh, I haven't listened to nine. I haven't listened to. I think to I remember that intern. Do you remember, like she, at nine five? Like yeah, I'm gonna five, say five. it's been a while. But well, like, what's funny is Sarah the intern was like the station manager. She wasn't an intern at all. That's oh. neither was this one. Oh, we totally. I didn't know we stole so that. She bit. wasn't. <laughs> no, she wasn't an actual intern. Like she was. The station manager on hmm. 955. Were they owned by the same company? Yeah. <laughs> were you no, actually in 955. I know. What's Do that? you know what to tell us? You actually on 955. No, no, no. I tell us. You're giving an alias radio <laughs> station. Is, I don't think that's out in Coleman, Michigan. No, is I don't it? Think, no, I think it's not. Did you make but that I, name up? I, it happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really yeah, it's Mike Wilson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been Somebody pull a map up. I don't know. Where, I don't know if I believe this city really exists. So, uh, so then, then you had a, you had actually. Well, she wasn't an intern. She was the manager, and but she was she was. She's been sidekick. on the radio forever, and yeah, us together made a, a really good show. And I'm one of those people that, um, like, even with Jimmy, if if it wasn't for Jimmy, Free for All Friday wouldn't be what it is. It's I I need that companionship. I need mm -hmm. that riffing. Um, we I fully think it works understand better. that. Yeah. 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 We fully yeah. understand. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so now I meet a girl. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So here's where the story starts. There it is. So <laughs> I, I'm hosting a stage, and there's a girl backstage helping the bands bring their equipment in because people used to volunteer to do that. And uh, I meet her. I, I instantly, I instantly had interest. Uh, NF, uh, I met NF for the first time there, and uh, I, I was actually the first person in radio to put NF on the radio. Really? really? Yep, Nate. No way. In fact, I've known Nate for years. His mom had, like two years since his mom had died, I knew him at 17. And he was there God, at this festival. Time ago. Oh my gosh. When he talks about that first CD, if you guys listen, he talks about how people don't remember his first CD. I have his first CD from when he told me to play it at this festival. And uh, that was a blast. And I met her backstage there. Mm -hmm. One of the songs he had on his first CD was the song called Beautiful. And it was to a girl that didn't realize how beautiful she really was. So I'm young and cute, you know, and I'm, I'm <laughs> digging this girl, right? And I had just met her, but like, it was one of those things where I just kind of knew. And so I gave her the CD and I'm like, listen to this track, <laughs> right? And I'm all like, go ahead and listen to it. So she's listening to it. And then all of a sudden on my, my show, I start talking about her, like dropping little hints, right, about what I knew, and then we started hanging out, and then I realized, like, radio doesn't make a lot of money unless you syndicate, and we didn't really have a, a big syndication option. So I needed to find something because I really fancied this gal, mm -hmm. and if we were ever going to get married and all that other stuff, I needed to find something that I could make a lot of money in fast. So I started to get involved in car sales. Mm -hmm. Now, going into professional car sales, I can't be Johnny Big. Here you go again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I dropped, this is funny, so I went as Johnny B. Now, most people would oh. think Johnny B is Johnny Brines. But Johnny B was Johnny Big. I wasn't you doing just, the Brines, I was yeah. doing the Big. 
I dropped the IG, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and uh, what happened, ended up happening, as everybody can imagine, if you go by Johnny B, everybody started going, Johnny B. Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think of John B., the artist. Good. Yeah, wait, I wait, thought wait, of wait, that. Hold on, wait, wait, hold on. Hold how do you wait, even know? Like, three for three. All right, so I'm going to speed through this. How do you know about John? Yeah, yeah. like there's some stuff we talk about, and you're like, nope, don't know. <laughs> right. but you know so John today, B. You know everything. Today, like, well, uh, to be fair, R&B is like my favorite music genre, so. Okay, oh, all right. Now that okay. makes sense. But yeah. makes sense. John B's like. Classic. Like, yeah. Like old school, old soul, and, yeah. and he stood out because he's European. He's European, yeah. and he's an R&B singer. That's yeah. awesome. Brooke, right. we are so <laughs> impressed. I am like, <laughs> man. The you question are... is, do you know who John? I, B is? I, do you know who John B is? I just wanna, I just wanna let you guys know, I am not that John B. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it really was Pullman, Michigan. Wait a minute, okay? You can't I just, sing. Just you can't sing. Sing? What's that? Oh, I can sing. sing. I'm just, I just, oh, you're singing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll hold the pole karaoke out right now. <laughs> we're gonna hold you to that. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we got some things in the works that we're, we're, oh, we're, we're gonna hold you to I'm that. Ready. Just yeah. wait for after it. After you pick the tune, I'll sing it more. Yeah, we'll talk about that after hours. Off the record. Off the record. Oh, I love that. All right, so go So, Johnny B. So, Johnny B. And I started working in car sales, and I had this one lady that came in. And um, and it, she she bought a car from us, and it was the highest grossing sale in the history of that that dealership. They couldn't believe I sold it to her at the price I did. Not only that, but I told her that. What car was it? I was just. Uh, it was, I, was, I was really bad with cars. I was really good with people. Yeah. Okay. In fact, that this is this is really interesting because at this point in time, I had just met Grant Cardone as well. Oh really? And oh, I was nice. actually doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with him because he was transferring transferring from being a car sales coach into a regular sales coach. Oh. So I was one of ten people in his book club before he launched uh, the Ten X Rule. No way. People got a copy. I was one of the ten people. I used to sit face to face with them, and we used to do a thing about the Ten X book. That's so he cool. Came to Coleman. What's Michigan? that? Yeah, it was in Coleman, Michigan, yeah. Uh, no, we were in Saginaw at that point in time. <laughs> and this is the real, that Grant Cardone, by the way. <laughs> Has any of the producers looked up if there's real Coleman, Michigan? Because <laughs> I'm waiting for you. I'm looking at all three of you and no one. I want to see where it's located. No one's looked this Just up yet. Just give us the, the hand. Yeah, show us where yeah, it is yeah, in the middle. So Midland's like right here, and Coleman is like right here. Oh. <laughs> They're very small little towns. I, you didn't even move. Yeah. Oh, I, I did. Yeah, you didn't even move. Right, right didn't here move. to there. Uh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> My <laughs> finger, <laughs> got tilting. Got My finger right now is covering Midland, Saginaw, Bay City, and Flint. That's the problem. Oh. I have these. That's the issue. So Coleman's in there. Uh, all right. We believe it. Right, we, so all right, all so right. the manager comes up, and his jaw drops when I tell her that this is the highest grossing sale. Because you're not supposed to tell somebody that you're taking a bunch of money from them. <laughs> but I had built enough rapport. I had built a lot of rapport with this lady. And she didn't, she literally let, well, I'm so glad. Good for him. And he goes, yeah, that's why we call him Johnny Be Good. <laughs> and she said, he's not good. He's awesome. awesome. And I instantly said, I why have when good I'm... when you can have awesome? And that there was it. it. Johnny Awesome was born. Wow. That was how it happened. That is a that's a fun yeah. story. Yeah. That's yeah. a pretty Have awesome you ever told story. this lady mm. that she changed Did, your name yeah, permanently? So what's really funny is I was invited out to her um I, I was invited out to a couple of her family events. Like she <laughs> loved me. It was mm. and it was cool. It, it, I spent a lot of time with her. She this is a great example of how we treat people. She walked in, she didn't look like she was, you know, she kind of looked a little crazy, right? <laughs> She she herself was sixty. She came in with her ninety seven year old husband who could barely work walk work walk. He probably couldn't work either. <laughs> this he, she was the young the oldest gold digger I ever met. But she was open about it, and so was he. He literally said she keeps me warm at night <laughs> and laughed. And he she, he was rich. She was just spending his money, but she was also like seventy. So it was this funny little situation. It's the oldest gold digger. I love that. That's like yeah. really, like the oldest gold digger you've ever met. Yeah, and she but she was great. They knew. Yeah. They knew. It they, worked for them. They, it, worked it worked for them. For them. <laughs> and they were okay with it. Yeah. And she was okay spending money. She basically, I think, bought this car and knowingly, like I showed her the numbers. Like I wasn't. I'm not a dishonest person. I'm probably crazy for that. But I literally showed her like. This is $4,000 less than a brand new one. <laughs> 
Brian, and she <laughs> bought it because she wanted to help me grow and my family grow. Like, mm -hmm. she wanted us to have that, and this is one of the ways that she could do it, right? And it's because I spent time with her. I mm -hmm. looked her in the eye and met her like she was a person. I was out on the lot with her for eight hours that day. No way. And That's... nobody else would even wait on her because she was just this crazy looking oh, lady with. There it went. <gasps> All right, so let's pause. Wow. Well, pay. Well, pay. <laughs> Producer, well, pay. Well, pay. Broke the microphone. It's good. It's good. that. It's Don't that. Is it because I'm pounding on it? It's yeah. That. Don't pound on it, Johnny. You're going to make it move. <laughs> My milkshake brings all the boys we got. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's better than yours, Dana. It's better than yours. Well, pay, you. definitely. But you I'm sorry, I broke it. <laughs> <laughs> take it out of his pay. All right, take it from the top. <laughs> Yeah, so Eight the way that I got watch. Johnny Awesome started when I was first born. I was mm. born. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's yeah. So I don't know. Where, uh, that's so that's where Johnny Awesome was born. Is that when you legally changed your name though? No, no. So, because at this point still a in time, girl in the picture. Yeah, and I don't so think she this, was Mrs. Girl, awesome. No, she was Mrs. Brines at this point in time. So at that point in time, um, we had been married. We, we had just gotten married a month after we got married. We got pregnant with our first son. Uh, all this happened really, really fast. And um, I wanted to change my name real bad. She didn't want to change her name. I actually started looking into it. And uh, what, what we found out was with a novelty name like Awesome, you have to pay an attorney to basically argue why that's a name that you should be able to have. And I was quoted like $6,000 for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So I had a new wife, a son on the way, and it was not It was just a dream at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I was told that there's three freebies that you can get. And I don't remember what the other two was. <laughs> but unfortunately, one of them is divorce. And Free, so, What do you mean by freebies? So there's three times, there's three things that can happen in your life. There's three life events that okay. can happen. You can change your name. Where you can change your name. For free. Yeah. And it's a free change. Oh. Okay. Got you. Okay. And that, that was what one of them was. Divorce. Okay. Yep. So well, I think it's probably marriage, divorce, and... Because marriage, you can change your name for free, marriage, too. Marriage, divorce, and death, probably? Probably. I, I would... Well, well, how why would you want to change your name when you die? Just to screw everyone over. And like... <laughs> they all thought they are getting their inheritance. Or, or, or if parents <laughs> die. Yeah. Or maybe. I know it's probably something to do with death. Or it could probably have something to do with adoption. Oh, so adoption. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. Another one, too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll look so, that up. question. Yeah. Answer. What did you guys do when you got married? She. So I assume she didn't take on your last name? She did. Yeah, but it wasn't oh. awesome at that time. Right. But So she took on the name that you didn't want. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so did all my kids. So what was the time period in which you met her backstage? Yeah, three months. You well, married after three months? Uh, ish, yeah. So let me see. Oh, well, no, it was a little bit longer than that. Uh, <laughs> we met, the concert was in July. Okay. And then we started hanging out. But, you know, one of the things, a lot of, a lot of people were like, man, that was really fast. The thing is, it's not about the time, it's about the quantity and the quality. Quality, quality, over, quality, quality, quantity. Quantity. It's about the quality over quantity. Yeah. So I would do things like one day I picked her up and uh, we drove all the way out to here. And we visited some friends of hers at this church, um, and we spent the entire day, 12 hours, of me asking her questions and getting to know her, and her doing the same. Mm -hmm. Like, imagine my podcast for 12 hours. That's kind of how I was. Yeah. So by the time we sat down in December, she had, at this point in time, we had not officially dated. We'd never officially gone out on a date. And um, she, she did not believe in dating. She was, a, she was a homeschooled girl. She believed in, uh, there's a book that, that is famous uh, amongst the homeschooled Christians called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. She was really into that. And um, one day I helped her get her tire off. She couldn't get her tire off the car. And I, I made a little bet with her. I said, if I can get this tire off your car, then you need to go on a date with me. We're going to call her a date. We're going to treat it as a date. I'm going to pick you up. And uh, she said, okay. She didn't think I could do it. Man, I got that tire off that car, so that's my Superman strength. You know what it's like you chase women, like, got it, baby. <laughs> yeah. Throw a thing aside. I don't know how I did it. It was, uh, it was crazy. Uh, and uh, I had already at this point in time asked her parents and had their blessing as well. Like they wait, 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 hold on, wait. I got to back up. Yeah, second. yeah. I, I took so the tire off the car. I, I know. I feel like we're close to the same age. Yeah. How old are you? 
I'm 44. Okay. So how mm. how how we met girls? <laughs> I'm 38. No, no, no. That's why I said close. No, I got to say close. No, yeah. you're, you're, babe, you're 38 forever. I'm 38 forever. Yeah. So he's well, the same how age. I met girls was totally different. Yeah. Oh, I, so Coleman. So, <laughs> so that's a good point because courting women in that way, and I heard you use that word earlier. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, not just saying it. For I'm the saying we're, we're just saying awesome <laughs> yeah, yeah. like this no, right? entire podcast. But no, this, good. that's why. I, even yo, you guys having that twelve-hour conversation before even going on a date, yeah, is pretty. Like I don't, because in my mind, at forty-four, when I was your, when I was younger, we would meet at a club, <laughs> yeah, and then that's how you kind of had a, a girlfriend, possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I like that. That's yeah, you know, we the, teach our kids you don't date for sport. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, like it, we have an eighteen-year-old, we tell them all the time you don't date yeah. for sport. Yeah. Like it's it, not a sport; it's that's a purpose. At this point in my life, it was it was with intention. Um, I was I was very much studying. I was already into a lot of business. I was studying uh, the how personality types, and I was already I was already getting there, right? And so when I went to her house to visit her first time, and she was on the back doing a Sudoku puzzle, I was like, "There it is! Like this is going to be a match." You know what I mean? Like it, it just it's how it works. And so like I was like, she could absolutely compliment me, and. Uh, but by the time we we had our first date, we only ever had one date before we got married. Wow! It was one date, and I took I took a bunch of cards with me on our first date that were like all the other questions that I needed to know. Like it was like a game show going on a date with me. <laughs> like, aren't you the right one? Let's see how many kids do you want to have? Uh, and, <laughs> And, but what I was doing is making sure that we were compatible because I didn't mm -hmm. want to continue, you know, I didn't want to go down a road with her uh, it, unless it led to marriage and, and having a family because yeah. why go through that heartbreak and, and why do that? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, I was at a point in my life where I was ready to I was ready to have a family and really make something and of myself. And how old were you at this time? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't know, 24, 20, 5, maybe, 23, okay. 4, 5. And you're ready to have a family? What's that? Already? <laughs> well, well, okay. So I wasn't. I was ready to start having. So when you start to have a family, it, it starts with with you know mom and dad. It doesn't start with well. I guess it starts, no, it starts with husband, with husband and wife. wife. We, well, I, I wanted to wait. She, it, it starts with trust. It start, you're right. It does. <laughs> Not always though, man. There's some people you know they don't have trust at all, and it, that's just a mistake. But yeah. correct. But, I mean, but if you think the, about it. But the route you were going. Right. Because we, we wanted to lay the foundation. Is what we wanted to lay. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. I think about my first. I was my first marriage. I got married at. 20 turning 21 in my first marriage and now I think about it I was like what was I doing? <laughs> yeah. not, not in a negative way. He didn't way. do a game show with you. He did not do yeah, a game that's... show but we dated for many many yeah. years like yeah. we had dated I was in high school when we met but in, but the crazy part about it was is we came from families that pressured when yeah. you're getting married yeah. when you're getting but, married. Well, I, yeah. I think the, the thing is dating is it's a different it's a different element. It's a different element for different people. Yep. Well, from from you, from it sounds like a biblical background. Yeah, yeah. yeah or yeah. a and moral standpoint. It, 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 both. And I was I was I was just past that. I was just past that in my life where I just yeah. wanted to date and have fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was looking for somebody that I could be a husband over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, somebody so. that I could protect and love and Listen, somebody yeah. I could husband's come home over. To. Right. Right. So, yeah. And and I mean we've lost some of that uh, you know nowadays and it, it's a shame because you know there's you know and, and I, I support you know I support whatever whatever people want you know if, if people are as long as it's right for them but for me I knew what I was looking for I was looking for a wife uh, I, I was okay if she worked or didn't work I was okay with that as long as I could support her mm -hmm. and you know that's kind of that's kind of what I always felt my role was is I'm a supporter, I'm a helper, you know, mm -hmm. this is what I do with people. And coming home to somebody every day and being able to help and, uh, you know, and then like you said, being a husband over somebody, mm -hmm. that was that was something that I was ready and was looking for. And because of that, I was really super intentional about it. So when we, when we got together for that first date, we spent a lot of time, uh, again, getting to know each other. And I knew everything about her at that point in time. And she knew uh, a lot about me. And, um, we decided to get it going to marriage counseling from our first date. We called our pastor, hmm. and uh, he started counseling us. And within four weeks, he goes, "Guys, you guys are so <laughs> compatible and ready to get married." He says, uh, "On the fourth week, he walks up. He goes, what are you guys doing Friday?'" He, <laughs> yeah, he yeah, wow. our pastor did this, <laughs> and I literally picked your wedding date. Yeah, yeah, to a lope. And I said to him, "I'm like." 
Dude, their family's gonna flip. <laughs> their mom's already like giving me the stink eye because she knows like I'm getting serious. I mean, in, in a short, in a three month period of time, I I left a job that wasn't paying anything. I started working at a car dealership. I became I sold the the highest grossing sale. Had enough money now to not only get married but to provide a house uh, well, an apartment. We started an apartment. I had all this in in a three or four month period of time. You're getting your ducks in a row. Oh man, I got them yeah. fast, man. When you find that person, you yeah. know, it's it was there. I got yeah. those ducks straightened up real fast. So, so what were religion ready. were both of you guys? Yeah, so uh, we're both Christian, okay. and um, she. But you say you said you, I'm sorry, I'm not interrupting, but you said you came to a church down here. Yeah. Is that the church you eventually were a part yeah. of? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. We'll oh, get it gets there. crazy. Wait for it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so we the pastor. Told us to get married. We we sprung it on her folks, and he's, how'd that go for you? Well, uh, fortunately, I had enough money to already have a place. Okay. Now we were we were doing uh, we were we were doing things right, uh, and um, so we put her in in. So here's what the pastor said. Now, again, I I don't know I don't know if I fully at the time I 100 percent agreed with him, but biblically speaking, you're under your parents' household and. You know, you're supposed to obey your parents, but that's until you're not in their household. So the pastor was pretty much like, if you can move her out of the house if her parents don't agree, then you're still good to roll. <laughs> it, 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 it is what it is. That was his perspective. And we accept that. Do you want to go in the biblical? Well, I was going to say, interpretation is self Motivated. It is. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. No, hey, hey, listen, it worked for us. <laughs> I'm like, you're right. like, sweet, so sign me up. When we went to go, her her mom flipped on me. Like she was really mad because I was like, hey, we're getting married on Friday. How old was she at this oh, she's time? Twenty-one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we only had four years uh, in between us. Mm -hmm. Um, so she... We're getting married on Friday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, it was Super See Bowl. See there. It was Super Bowl Sunday. Oh, and, wow. and this was the night we... Our pastor had just met with us on Friday. So you really did take that date that he gave you? Yeah. <laughs> why, why wait? Listen, we, we, I, had, I wanted a band to come in. I, I wanted to have a big broadcast. He said, guys, are you getting married for other people and for the party? Or are you getting married for each other? Yeah, that's true. And yeah, I went. Super Bowl he, Sunday. He said you can have a party <laughs> anytime. <laughs> well, yeah. So I'm sorry. So that <laughs> was crazy. The Friday. Football freaks. <laughs> Super Bowl Sunday comes up, and me and her were just sitting there the whole time, like because we knew we had to tell him at some point in time, and we didn't move or anything. <laughs> and finally, it's the end of the night. Everything's clearing up. I mean, we're still sitting there. I don't even. I don't remember <laughs> watching the football game. I must have been sweating. And uh, and then finally we're like we have something to tell you. Her mom was like, I knew it. And they sat down. And her dad just instantly started smoking, and it was like, like they were Did like they something was, was off the whole night. No, no, no. They oh. knew that I was going to ask my like, oh, tell them we were going to get married. So when I told them and then told them that it was happening on Friday, they were like, you are not allowed. And, and they got into the whole thing of mm. you're taking our baby. She was the oldest. They were really close together. It was a thing, and so Britt was prepared. She went up and got her bag. She moved out, and uh, and and then and then I I got a call from the pastor's wife, and she said, "You guys have caused so much trouble in my household. I have family members of hers calling, and they're like, what are you doing allowing them to get married?'" And she goes, "And all of that's fine, but you never ask the father his permission." Oh, and I was like, "Yeah, whoops." <laughs> And she goes, you need to go do that right now. And uh, I was like, I already messed it up. I was like, okay. She goes, yeah. go. I mean, like right now, go. <laughs> so I got in my car and left yeah. and drove and knocked on the say, door. Talk to your husband about what he recommended. Wasn't this the pastor's wife? <laughs> yeah, right. the pastor's wife. <laughs> he probably yeah. forgot that part. He, he was so excited he's, about he's this so Friday. Mad. He was. He dude forgot was so ready to marry us. He was so the ready. Whole protocol yeah, up yeah, until yeah. that point. Was, yeah. 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 So it was that was a Wednesday night. It was a Wednesday night, and I went and knocked on the door. And at this point in time, Britt's moms had started talking to her again. She like blacklisted us for a couple days. <laughs> She answers the door and she just goes, oh, Donnie, the door's for you. And she just walks away. And Donnie walked up and I told him, I said, look, I love your daughter. I would love to, I want to love her for the rest of her life and take care of her. And look what I've done in this amount of time just to be able to do that. 
I'm going to marry her on Friday, mm-hmm. but it would mean the world to both of us if I could have your blessing to do it. And he smiled, and he gave me a big old hug and kissed me and said, Aww. son! Oh, Sweet. okay. And then he slept on the couch that night because Tish was still really mad I at me. I was going to say, my- <laughs> go <over well laughs> yeah. his house, but, but the pastor's house was great. <laughs> so we we got married. It was kind of an elopement. Her entire family showed up. Uh, only Only a couple of people from my family showed up. And uh, and yeah, we eloped. We had a we went right to our apartment um, afterwards. The pastor actually kicked us out. That dude was so ready to expand his church. He, he there was a meal in the basement and stuff. He's like, they got better things to do. He, he kicked, kicked us out. They all sat and ate. Yeah, he yeah. wanted us to go home. <laughs> 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 he, he was a good. He was an old country boy. Okay. And uh, and he's from he was from Kentucky. So family was really important to him. Marriage was really important to him. And and what he taught us about marriage was that it's the one flesh mentality and it was really he ingrained it in us that that you never ever let go of that Mm -hmm. right and at the end of the day it's not 50 50 it's whatever it takes to make it work Mm -hmm. and if one of you isn't doing that then the other person has to pick all that up Mm -hmm. and at the same aspect as a husband everything is falls on your shoulders if it's a loss you lost if it's a win you share the win with your spouse Mm. that was kind of what he constantly ingrained in me and and what i went into the marriage with Mm. so how the heck did i become johnny awesome out of all of that yeah yeah so unfortunately and and this is the part that that gets real difficult and Mm -hmm. so there's two caveats that that i want to say right off the beginning uh number one uh i I do not want anybody to, this make when I tell people this story, they get really, some people have, they, every, people have all different emotions. And some people get really mad and they say lots of things and they call people names. I don't want any ill will towards my ex-wife. I fully believe that she was deceived and that people can be deceived. Number two, I was not a perfect husband by any means, nor do I, and I know it sounds cute and I sound cute, but there was a certain time in our marriage where things got really, really hard and I didn't know how to handle them well. And I handled them very, very poorly. And um, and so what ended up happening was we, uh, it's a good time for a water break. (laughs) It's it's almost getting hot in here. Yeah. I'm over here firing. Let me me fill you up before you go in with the story. Hmm. But you can keep going. Could I get Kleenex too? Yes. Just in case. Yeah, I I got you. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. So. What ended up happening was um, there was there was a lot of different there was different issues and in every marriage there's issues. The question is is are you going to work through those? Because that's what marriage is. Marriage is work. Marriage isn't a certificate. And we uh, we were having some issues uh, here and there. Um, a lot of them with just insecurities and and the people that that I work with and and stuff like that. I, I was. One of the biggest failures I think in my marriage was I I always wanted to get to the point where my wife saw herself as beautiful as I saw her. Mm. And unfortunately, we ended before I ever got there. Mm. And because of her, um, I just didn't create an environment where where she could get there. And, and I'm not saying that you know it was all my responsibility, it's not. We can only be responsible for what we can be responsible for, but um, I, I definitely was not able to do what I really wanted to do. And so we had been going to this church, and I started recognizing a few little issues with the church, but um, they, they started getting more and more problematic. And in 2016, the church decided that they were going to give us uh, some mentors for, for our marriage. I had been wanting to go to marriage counseling. And um, the church wanted to do that instead. So they gave, us, they gave us these mentors. And when we got these mentors in, the mentor that Britt got had a different viewpoint when it came to marriage and headship. And she did not like me. And I knew it from day one. In fact, on day one when we left, I said, that lady does not like me. And she used to pull Britt aside. And she, every Sunday and every time we meet, she'd be like, is your is your husband abusive is he hitting you is he doing this that and the other thing and brit used to come and tell me this was it a married i'm sorry was it a married couple or did you have individual counselors nope this was a so this was a married couple the husband would talk with me and the wife would talk with brit Mm. 
I don't think that's right. You guys should be in the no, same room. No, yeah. And Even that in itself. That's why, like, I'm sure you saw my face as you were saying that. I'm like, wait a minute. Why is she having conversation? So that's why I was confused if it was an actual married couple. Yeah. Or... If, yeah. if it was two separate counseling sessions. So we would we would come together, but there was a lot of individual conversations that were happening. And the individual conversations that were happening were not the type of conversations that really should be happening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, not, not that they should be happening, but the way that they were happening. And, you know, my... If you, they've done a lot of psychological studies. They, they did the broken girl test, or some people, or broken arm test that some people might know, where they told a, a girl over and over again that she broke her arm. And she kept saying, mm, I didn't break my arm. And then after a six month period of time, not only did she have a story how she broke her arm, but she could actually feel pain of where she broke her arm. So there was, I felt like there was a little bit of programming going on. But it wasn't just that, and Britt was kind of alerted to that too, so I remember calling the pastor, I'm like, why, why are they asking, why is she asking these questions? And he just said, well, she's doing her due diligence, you're a big, loud man, right, and she's small, and so they're just making sure that they're doing their due diligence, and I later learned that her husband came from an abused background, she, she was a feminist, she's, she lays more on the feminist side of things, she is the man in that household, therefore our household didn't jive with how she did things, and so there's a lot of attacks on me. Mm -hmm. During that point in time, I didn't know how to handle that. I went from, uh, you know, I went from a marriage that, that we were both working on to all of a sudden, uh, I had a wife that would tell me things like, you don't deserve to call yourself a head of a household. Or she knew how to really hurt me. She would say things like, how, how, why would anybody ever follow you? You're not a leader. Yeah. And I didn't realize she was getting text messages from this person at the church saying these things to her. How does your husband consider himself a leader? So if we got into a fight about something, she would bring these up because she was getting told this stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, being fed. And, I mean, there was... There was things that we disagree about, you know, again, from my background and, and household, like, like she used to discipline the children, she would discipline them in front of the other kids. And for me, that's a no-go. You don't, you don't do that. You pull them aside, you get into their heart first before you ever have to discipline them. Mm. And most of the time, they convict themselves if you do it that way. Yeah. So anytime we saw a difference like that, she was being told that she didn't have to accept mm. that, right? And I was like, how do you handle that? And so... You know, there was there was times I slammed the doors. There was times where I had punched a door in frustration. Those things happen, right? You're human. The the crazy part about all that is is that's really the extent of where everything went. And I'll, I'll share you another story. Um, you know, things started getting worse. She started to kind of start ignoring me, and and things just started. To, that's when everything started to go downhill. Was when we started with this counseling couple were you still doing the counseling after you noticed all of this uh, so i had asked the pastor to walk away from them and to to go to regular counseling i wanted to go to real marital counseling the wife takes the wife the man takes the man and then they come together at the mm -hmm. end and here's here's let's work through the issue now right, let's mm -hmm. talk about instead it. of let's just complain let's just complain and then you know there's no solution at the end of the day so um i had told the i had told the pastor i said look at this text and he wouldn't look at it i'm like she, the things that my wife's being texted and told right now are not things that I would find yeah. biblical, and they're not helping our marriage at all. So please, like, I don't, let, let's, mm -hmm. can you just tell them to separate? So instead of, uh, so I had found a marriage counselor for us. I was all set and ready to go, but Britt wouldn't go because the church told us that we needed to use their people that weren't counselors. So... Um, the counselors that I did find said it's, there's no, there's not going to be any resolution or help by doing both. So if if she's willing to at least do that, maybe you can start getting some truth out of this next couple. So we started going with this couple at the church again, and little did I know that other lady kept talking to her, and you know, she kept having these conversations, and um, and it was it, it was a very very difficult uh, mm -hmm. time, and it started getting worse and worse and worse, and I knew that that church was an issue. And every time I'd bring the church up, there was a lot of fights. And it's weird because in the back of my head, I always thought, man, would my wife leave me over a church? Like, is that even a thing that can happen in a Christian relationship? Mm -hmm. And uh, 
at, at this point, how many children did you have? Like, because uh, you you had gotten pregnant a month after you got married. So at yeah. this point in your relationship, how many children were then involved? So so we would have had three in twenty sixteen. We would have had three, which was really young, going into our fourth. Okay, mm. yeah. so almost your complete family. Yeah, almost the complete family. Yeah, and um, and so you know, and and all boys and I, I, I it was. It started to get. It just started. It seemed like everything was getting better, actually. And and I was I was actually thankful for it because I was I was learning how to deal with stuff like you know especially anger and and uh, there was this one moment in life where I I stepped on one of my son's toys in the kitchen and my wife told him a hundred times not to play in the kitchen and it was super early in the morning and she was you know we were kibitzing. And I stepped on that, it hurt, I got angry, I kicked it, and the, the car smashed against the side of the wall. And I'll never forget, I didn't know that my son was sitting up awake already. And he, he got up and he walked over and he said, it's okay, Daddy, I can fix it. Mm. And that moment was, uh, it was like 2018, and I realized, man, that's, I'm never going to let that happen again. My kids should not fix my mistakes. You know, that was the type of thing my dad used to do. He, um, when I was really young, he smashed a picture in my, my room, and as the blood ran down his hand, he threw it at me because he was mad at my mom. And I, I called the only person I knew how to call at the time, which was one of the members of that church, and I met with him at 6.30 sometime in the morning, and we really started. And, and I, I believe that that moment was put into my life to really change my perspective. And from that date, I said, no matter how I get treated, my wife is still the queen. I still have to treat her as such. And as somebody that believes in the biblical stance of marriage, I'm supposed to present her as clean, no matter how she is. So I'm going to really work on this. Mm -hmm. And that was a changing moment for me. I, I, um, I, we, I stopped arguing with her the way that we did. I started getting a, a lot of uh, a help with different people trying to just monitor everything. And um, and I thought everything was on the up and up. Until one time, and she, Britt just made the comment like, no, she doesn't feel like anything's better. And I was like, "What? what's going on here? Like every week the, the counselors are saying that, not again, it's saying counselors, just the church members, mm -hmm. but they're saying that we're getting better. And like, I, I don't, I haven't, you know, I'm treating, I'm doing all these things. We're, we're trying all these things now. I'm not calling her names. Nobody's being insulted. Like, not that that stuff has happened before, but it did every now and then. It slipped out. Like I said, I wasn't a perfect husband, but I really tried on that stuff. And I was perplexed. And so they said, well, in this case, we're going to go ahead and get you a real counselor. I was like, thank you. Finally. Because at this point in time, I, I, I couldn't see, like, how we weren't how we weren't doing better how she felt like that but she also would stop communicating with me because she was communicating with these other people now she's mm -hmm. starting to get this little ring of people and so there was more than one yeah and what i found was our phones were connected to our computer and she didn't realize this and so i found her text this one time and what would happen, she'd only talk about the negative and then it would get ex es escalated and it would get round robin and it was like it was like uh, she became the center of like you know all this attention, and our these stories got really big and and no, no facts about the stories. It was just these really big. I'm having a horrible day. Well, we'll pray for you and blah 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 and all this other stuff. And I'm like, wait, what happened? <laughs> right. Like what's going on? And eventually it got to the point where I'm like, man, we got we got to get out of this this church. And some weird things started happening where. You know, I gave a member of, uh, another member was over at my house one time, I gave him a book, and a week later the pastor showed up and said, I'm not allowed to pass books out to members, the only books that are allowed are the books that are in the library. Um, they in kicked, their library? In oh their, yeah, yeah, it got yeah. very like that. That's what I was going to say, and they're, so they want to control information. Yeah. So they they had just finished kicking another pastor out, they, they took him up for church discipline, they kicked him out when these new guys took over, they closed the doors to the church and they changed their philosophy of everybody's welcome to you go to where if you know you go to another church you just stay there and you do your church thing and we're going to do ours and it got it got started getting really weird right yeah 
Um, I was the drummer of the church, I uh, was one of them, and I had a question about one of the things that they were mentioning, and I was told... Don't question. No, I was given no. a book, <laughs> and I said, read this book, and then we'll, we'll discuss it, but until you've read this and we've discussed through this, as the heartbeat of the church, because the drum keeps the beat, um, you, you, you shouldn't play drums anymore. Because I had a question. So I was taken away from you. And I said, shouldn't we just go to the Bible instead of a yeah. book? Right? Like, it was weird. So it started getting worse, and then COVID happened. And when COVID happened, the church shut down. They formed this government committee, and they put this crazy newsletter out about how, like, if you didn't agree with them, you know, you weren't showing your kids how to be Christ followers. And I was like, man, this is my opportunity. I started looking for churches, right? So I ended up, I was looking all over for churches. Fast forward, I find a church, and that's when everything went crazy. Mm. I start going to this church, and it was right around the time that I was looking for all these other churches that my wife comes up and she says, I'm really depressed and I, I, need, to go to, I need to go to real counseling. I'm like, great, right? Finally, we're getting to real counseling. The counseling was recommended to me through Five Points. It was a Five Points affiliated counseling center right i'm like no I'm like you need to go to a real counselor <laughs> right, right? licensed tim five yeah. points was the church the church oh shoot yeah i probably should have said that screw it five points uh was we the church yeah. That's, that's all right. yeah i don't know if you should if you, if it's your truth it's, it's your truth, truth so. so it's uh it's 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 uh, so the uh the thing that ended up happening um she she started going there, but she started going because the lady again had convinced her to go there for abuse counseling. What is it with this lady? Oh, I know. Like I'm I'll trying show to you, figure. I, I have I have texts from her, and if you guys read them, you'd be like, how? And I submitted them to the pastor. I was so, gonna say, like, how is this even okay? Like, I, but I, I think everybody has those type of people. They may be church affiliates. They may may be best friends. But in this particular situation, it's somebody in the church. Yeah, yeah the fact it, that it's affiliated with the yeah. church is yeah. the problem. And it's it, it was just the mentality of, you know, essentially, my viewpoint is, here's a lady that saw this little girl and this, this oppressive, big, loud man, and that was the, her truth and her story. And because of that, that's what she saw whenever she counseled. Well, real counselors know not to do that. Yeah, you right. don't you don't take your presuppositions into a counseling session. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the one thing that kept happening. Mm -hmm. So instead of us getting better, it Brit just constantly felt like it never did, even though nothing was happening in the marriage, it was wrong. Yeah. And so this it was at this point in time that um, we we ended up, she ended up getting uh, this this counseling center, and um, man, it, it 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 wasn't it wasn't helping. It it got it got worse, and it was around this time too that we actually met. You came in shortly after. Mm -hmm. um, Britt was um, she she the, she didn't like she didn't like uh, um, one of the people that I worked with at this last team because her his wife was a model she modeled for a couple of magazines so she was really insecure about me being there even though the wife was never around um and she was so insecure and it was constantly such a thing that i quit i just quit i couldn't handle the stress anymore so i quit mm -hmm. and it was during this whole time that i ended up with this opportunity to go to randy mm -hmm. at nmhl because he was looking for somebody to help start his team and go away from the gamble team and launch an exp team and my name was brought up because um people knew that i had done this with a lot of teams i've been coaching at this point in time and so, so people, you were already in knew, coaching at that time yeah and i was helping i was helping businesses and and uh realtors that were ready to launch launch their businesses larger mm -hmm. right so because of that um i was recommended i went i thought this is a great opportunity for me to get out of here and then it'll be less stress for brit again trying to just think about how to how to harness this and um <laughs> Man, it was it was it, it just got it got so nuts. Um, the things that started happening were at, around this time. Britt told me she was no longer going to be affectionate. Mm. And when we talk about affectionate, what she meant was she wasn't going to say hello or goodbye. She never hugged me or kissed me. 
Um, she wouldn't acknowledge me, and she pretended as if I didn't exist. And um, that was a lot in due to what she was being told to do, not talk to me, right? You don't need to do that because of whatever reason. We, yeah, we what was the reasoning behind that? <sighs> the reasoning, well, the real reasoning behind it is if you can eliminate communication between two people, you can create that separation, that division. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's ultimately where it ended up. Um, and it was difficult because now I'm, I'm supposed to be this big, shiny person. I'm Now Randy wants me in his office. I'm, I'm launching this real estate team. And things started to go downhill. Britt had taken her bed out of my bedroom. She took one of my son's bed and moved it into the dining room. And she was just sleeping in there every night. So things like that, that's where we had started to go to. Mm-hmm. And then... When um, when I started going to this other church, her church came and suggested to her that she let me take the boys to my church one weekend and then take my kids and myself to her church the next weekend. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a separation mentality, right? Yeah. To which they mm-hmm. later accused me of calling them out on that. Um mm-hmm. And it just, it got to the point where I finally, I found a church I was comfortable at. I found a church. I went in there telling him everything. I sat down with the pastor for four hours. And I said, this is who I am coming in here and where we're at. And we, we, I started going there and I started getting support from them. And that other church sent their pastor to this church to sit down with my pastor. <laughs> and this is nuts. They came with this two page document. And they sat down and they read it in front of my pastor of all the sins and all the reasons why I shouldn't be a member of their church. And he actually said, your wife doesn't want to leave our church. Okay. At one point in time, this guy got so mad, he got up and he got in my face because one of the things that they they had stated in this letter is that for six years I had punched numerous holes in all the walls and all that stuff. And it was one door. It happened. I punched a door one time. One time I punched a door. And it was noted. One of the counselors knew it. But the way they wrote this letter is if like I had just gone through destroying this house with my anger and my rage. It was one time in 2016. We're in 2021 now, mm-hmm. right? 2022. And I looked at him and I said, you've never been to my house. The things that you're saying that I've done, you've never verified. Mm-hmm. And he got up and right in my face goes, I'm not going to let you take this over and blah, blah, blah. And it, so it you was, were there during this meeting? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was sitting there. What we were supposed to be talking about, what I asked him was how this was biblical for him to take the church to take my wife and, and tell her to just continue going to their church. I asked, how is that biblical? So they said, we'll sit down with you and your pastor and, and answer all of your concerns. And when they did, they just bombarded us with this, right, stuff. And at the end of it, the one thing that he did say, though, and my pastor agreed, he said, you need to go home tonight and ask your, ask your wife how you can help fix her living reality or something like that. And that right there was a red flag, because what living reality has to do with Christian living is two different things. But my pastor said, asking this and that version is a good thing that you should do. Mm-hmm. So I went home and I asked my wife, and... Um, I, I apologized to her again. I said, look, I don't know why we're at where we're at. And I don't know all the things I need to apologize for. But I love you. And I want to do whatever I can to make this work. And I really poured into her. And she backed away from me. And she said, I'm not ready for this right now. And she walked away. And then I went to bed. And she came in and, and woke me up and said, here's, my, here's what I want you to do. And she handed me this list. And on the list, number one was, I needed to submit to the spiritual authority of JJ, the pastor of the church. What? I needed to submit to the spiritual authority of oh, Five wait. Points Community Church. Oh, wait. Can we pause for one second? Yes. Yes, you know already. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Submitting to a man's authority right. is already kind of... <laughs> but I, I, I submit mean, you kind of understand a little bit. I, I understand one hundred yeah. percent. So, did well, you see? I, was, I don't even know if the camera caught yeah. my face. As soon as you said yeah. that, I was like, but submit to no, 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 it's okay. JJ. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then. That's the church. <laughs> and then I had to go through their counseling program, through the counseling program that Britt was going through. So at this point in time, I was still talking to that last, uh, the last marriage counselor that we had. Britt had stopped talking to him. 
I had continued talking to him. I thought the last guy that we had was actually decent, right? And so he was trying to help me work through all these things. And he goes, well, let's just take time and let's think about this. Let's see what's going to happen. And Britt threatened. She said, if you don't do these things, it's going to get a lot worse for you. <laughs> a she lot told, worse for she you. Told, she told me that. She said, it's going to get a lot worse. So at mm. this point in time, everything is bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm working this new job. Uh, and this is, this is the thing I, I, I told you guys afterwards. Like every day I walked into the office, that day was my worst day of my mm. life. Because things were not getting better they were declining, and they were declining in these ridiculous ways. And uh, a few months after that, um, the the pastor gave Brit a, a lot. They gave her all these just different templates with her and the the thing. And um, at this point in time, luckily, I was still in communication with my the, or our marriage counselor, and he said, "You need to be very, very careful what you do because they might tr be trying to set you up for sexual harassment because you can be." you can be accused of that within your own marriage and so i said well i haven't tried i i knew when the i knew when the door was shut and i we weren't in you know, she but the bed was in a different she room she moved in a totally different room yeah there was and i already told him i said it's already been it's been months right and so that has already been completely taken off the table i'm not opening that door up nobody is right and it was shortly after he said that that she formally submitted a form to me <laughs> Uh, written out like on this little coupon that basically said, "Yep, that that she was going to stop altogether." And again, this is not only this, this just isn't biblical. Anybody knows the Bible is something that you just don't do. And but I already I already stopped anyway, so not a big deal. I knew it was coming. She just wanted it to be official, and again, it had the seal of stamp of the church on it. Like just one thing after another. Stop what. Uh, sexual activity. Yeah, okay. as, as but, a, as a, as so a, she gave you a, a formal like it was notice. A, it's like a letter it, it that was, says I'm not having sex anymore. Yeah, yeah, Stamp yeah. Stamp yeah, by yeah, the church. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Wow. But it was it was actually a half a sheet where they where they cut it. So they, they like I think they got the other here? half. <laughs> yeah, it was it was this it was crazy. Like a permission slip. It's crazy. I I, sh I should have brought some so, of this so stuff because I have it. The yeah, church so officially. Crazy. So poured it and stamped the situation. So 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 okay. So there's no actual seal or stamp on it. Okay. The the they have a copy of this. I believe they have the bottom mm. copy. She must have printed it off there. But the the email was uh, the email was okay. Go ahead for it from from the pastor and you know let me know if you have any questions and so was it, this the same came, pastor? I'm sorry. Yes. From. That mirror, the from the Jersey beginning? No, 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 no. Oh, that, okay. that guy, he unfortunately passed away. Oh, I wish he was still okay. alive because he could have. Possibly talk, yeah, interjected. Yeah, okay. So, the, when that letter came, like it was, you know, you you haven't done these things, and this was the time when our marriage counselor um, had suggested you're not going to like this idea, but wh why don't you look into it? So I started looking into the counseling. The day that I submitted counseling at this counseling center, um, the next day, Britt had a meeting with the pastor of the church and then their their like leader guy. And the following Thursday, I received a letter from them stating that they weren't going to pick me up as a client. What What does that mean? That means that one of the demands that she sent me to go through this counseling center, they were no longer they weren't going to oh. listen to my side of what was going on. I was so she she I, demanded that you did it. But I don't then know it, what the demand was. I don't know how oh, so that all happened. Oh, so it wasn't in like the agreements that she had given you. Oh yes, yes, yes. Sorry. The, so the, the, the demand was that I had to do it, it but now but I got blocked from being able to do it. They yeah. rejected me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They Pretty said much. they said uh, they said that I should find a local church or a local person myself. Well, you did, and, and then they showed up at the church. <laughs> that was the one of the pastors. Yeah. So I thought to myself, all right. So, like the 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 thing that she wanted to do would be great because at least if I had a different counselor in the same center, mm -hmm. I could start talking to them, they could start talking to Britt's counselor, and they could start putting pieces together and be like, wait a minute, there's something's not right here, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was fighting and fighting and fighting. And we, we, went, up, uh, we went up north, we have a, a cottage that we go to every single year, and we have this family vacation. And she was acting super strange during that time. And, and I was on the phone with my pastor at this time. I said, no matter what happened, I'm having a hard time this week. I've had some personal time with her. She tried making sure I never have personal time with her. 
And I, and I told her, I said, listen, I'm trying to do these things that you're asking. And she says, well, you never went and got counseling. I said, you know that I tried to, but they denied me. She goes, well, you could go somewhere else. So I said, all right. It was right. a game play. Like at this point, you're playing it, games. It was, it was. Cat and mouse. I feel, and I, I, this, is, this is my honest feeling. I feel that they were trying to set me up for an impossible situation so they could say that I wasn't trying to do it. Mm -hmm. That way it was easier for them to divorce me and they could have done it sooner. In reality, they couldn't do that. So when we got back, I found a counselor. And as soon as I started to find one, now all of a sudden I'm doing the thing again. And all of a sudden another sheet comes from, the, from her in the church. <laughs> And it's saying that I didn't do the simple things that she asked me to do. And in there, it asked me to move out, to continue to pay for her gym memberships and for the kids um, mm -hmm. and all this other stuff and, until, until she was satisfied that I was at a place where she wanted me to move back into the house. And that was a difficult day because I knew where this was going. So I started calling a lot of places and they said, I called this one place called the Christ Center for Hope Counseling Center thing, and the dude was like, "I'm sorry, there's no hope." <laughs> I was like, "What? You're the Hope Center?" I'm like, there's "Man, why?" During this time, um, how was her family acting, and also what was the relationship between you guys and the kids? Yeah, so at this point in time, nobody knew that anything was was happening. The family did. I have a, I have a, I have a, um, I have a picture of the last family picture that we took mm -hmm. and nobody would even know that there was anything wrong and including me i didn't know like i knew that she sent me this thing and i was like man we gotta talk about this I, we had just gotten back from up north our family vacation she dropped this bomb on me and i was like i, I don't feel comfortable as as the man of the house i said look if if there's a danger happening here if i really felt if you could tell me what i'm doing i to this day have no idea what was happening like i asked and begged the church to tell me what is she saying i'm doing and they would never give any specific they didn't have any they would just give generalities and eventually they said well it's not an abuse situation it's an oppression situation the oppression came in because i was trying to take my kids to another church and i i didn't want them going to that church so in their viewpoint i was oppressing my family by not allowing them to go to five but they points. suggested that you alternate churches in the very beginning they did yeah in and the end in the end of that letter that they they wrote they said johnny has accused us of a separation mentality which wouldn't happen if he would have just continued going to five points mm. wow. that was their viewpoint so when I got this letter, I, it was like, I, I, I didn't know how to handle this. And she gave it to me at a time where my pastor was on vacation. It was, it was one of the holidays. My pastor was on vacation. The guy that I was talking to going back and forth was gone. I couldn't get into see a counselor in time because it was just the timing of the whole thing. And she literally gave me zero time whatsoever to get all this done. And um, I, I, she told, I knew it was going to get worse. I knew it was coming next. I was afraid every day of what was coming next, and um, and there was just there was just no way. I mean, in this in this economy, to up and find a place to live in rent and continue mm -hmm. to pay for an entire another family, and, and and at this point, I'm, I was so depressed and going through so much. My production just was awful anyway, so. It was it was not feasible, mm -hmm. right? And um, and every day I worried about what actually ended up happening. And that was that was when I walked through my front door, and there was a, a letter on my counter that said, "Don't forget to feed the cats." Mm -hmm. And um, my kids were gone; she was gone. Um, and um, it, it was that was a very very difficult day. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I had found that the church had actually taken them and moved them into a house. And Britt sent me a text and just said, "I was told just to let you know that we're in a safe location and that we're safe." And that was it. That was all I knew. So you didn't even know at all where, like, no communication communication at all with your kids she, up to this point like there was nothing she um 
Yeah, she um, she was moved into a home, and uh, I missed I missed their birthdays mm-hmm. and Christmas and New Year's, and uh, that was the hardest part of my life. They uh, they they being the church, and I'm still trying to scramble to figure this out. She she did this on the day that I finally gave in, and I was actually going to look at a house that night to rent, to just try to figure out whatever I could do to keep it together. Mm-hmm. And, and and we're talking, she gave me a week, and I didn't know what her time schedule was, but that's such a small time, and, and I'm going through all these different emotions, and she knew that I was going to meet with a landlord that night, mm-hmm. and that was the day that she decided, because again, if I would have done that and gone through with one more thing, it's showing that I'm trying to work through it. Right, and so they she had to find the something gun. else, yeah. So um, her and I think some of her family members, I know a church member or two, they backed a U-Haul up right into the yard. There was tracks for the U-Haul. They took her dressers and, and dumped all of my clothes right on the floor and, and the bookshelf. And when I got home, uh, everything was out of my house. I, I had one plate. They left me a plate, which was nice. Wow. Um, and cats. They left you and, the plate. And cats, which I was allergic to. They were her cats, by the way. <laughs> what? But where she had gone, she couldn't take the cats right away. So what she did, she took my dog and left me with the cats oh until she could come and pick the cats back up. And then we, then we did. We exchanged the cats with the dogs. And... Uh, so at this point, you walk in your house, and your house literally looks like it's been ransacked. Like... Oh, is that, I, is knew. That, I, I, I instantly you, you knew. You knew as soon as you opened the door? I knew because you could... Feel emptiness. Yeah. yeah. And um, man, there's no worse sound than deafening silence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was used to walking in, and even though she didn't greet me, my kids would always yeah. greet me. And you know, one of the things that she said that she was right about maybe a year earlier was I would get home and I was under stress, so you know, I'd go and sit in the chair, play a game or whatever, and de-stress myself. And she, she had made a, a sly comment off to the side, and she was right. And I decided I need to start coming home and looking at my kids in the eyes. The, mm-hmm. the average amount of time that a father looks in their kid's eyes, I believe the last time I heard is 36 seconds a day. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to be like that guy. So every night when I come home, my kids would run up, and each one of them would look at my eyes. And I'd sit in my chair, and they'd tell me about their day and what they did. And I'd hug them and I'd let them know that I was proud of them. Mm. And I'd tuck them in at night. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. Did you have did you have somebody close to you at that time that you could talk to? So not like I needed. Um, luckily I had a good pastor. And he was with me throughout a lot of it. This is this is where Randy came in though. Randy <laughs> Randy Gamble, for those of you that don't know, is uh, he really is an incredible human being, and 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 this is this is where Randy Gamble uh, is. Um, it, he's is an incredible person. He is. Um, I called him. He knew what had happened, and he was like, it, he's he was like, what's one thing that you've always wanted to do, like that Brit never will let you do, and I was like, go clubbing. <laughs> I, I want to go to Electricity in Pontiac. I mean, we went one time. Me and That's Bert went, the place you picked? Yeah, well, we and went one time, and she hated it. And so I was like, I'm big into techno music. I love lights and fog machines. Like, that's my jam, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm like, that's where. And Randy said, I don't want you to be alone tonight. Yeah, that's good. He said, I'll meet you there at 10. So here I am. And for those of you that know Randy Gamble, here I am. And Randy Gamble, you know, he, he comes flying up in his Corvette or whatever. And, uh, and we go inside this club. He pays for me to get in. And we're, we're sitting there. And he was trying to buy me drinks. And I'm not really, I'm not really trying to drink too much, especially when you're emotional. And, and I didn't really drink too much anyway. I didn't want to, to become one of the people that drink into their, their s- problems. Um, but we're sitting there, and the music is just, <laughs> you know, for, and, and Randy just stands there for two hours, and all of a sudden he just looks at me and goes, Johnny, I hate this music. <laughs> he said, uh, are you going to be okay if I leave? And I said, man, the fact that you showed up, you know, means the world okay. to me. And so he gave the bartender like 300 bucks, and he said, 
give him anything that he wants, and if he goes over this, call me. Like, he just slipped him cash. And I, that bartender had a lucky night that night right. because I didn't order any drinks. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and I went home, and um, I, you know, I... <laughs> I uh, I started to um, I started to really seclude myself. You know, it's mm. it was a lot to deal with, and mm. um, there was a there was a lot of things that, that I had to do mentally to work with, and it it was it was it was a lot. This is when I started to you know throw up every single morning, and um, and it was crazy because now I'm working for these agents, and I'm trying to pour into them every single day. This is the story that you didn't know about. So as somebody that knows the mind and, and, and the kind of how the mind worked, every day when I pulled up into the parking lot, I was so depressed. I would get to this elevator we had in our building and it would open. And when those doors closed, I could see myself. And that, that point in time when those doors closed, there's where Johnny, John Brines ended, because we weren't divorced yet. And when that elevator hit the second floor and the bell would go off, I had to become Johnny Awesome. Mm. And I had to walk out every single day like there was nothing wrong with my life mm -hmm. so that I didn't interrupt the success of somebody else. But I even think, even in that, I don't know, how do I word this? Um, to have that within growth and strength in your own self, because I know there's days when I'm having shit days and I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> like, don't yeah. talk to me, don't look at me, I'm just gonna stay home. So to even have that much strength within yourself, I hope you gave yourself grace. I hope you gave yourself that, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, positivity or, I don't even think that's the right you just word. Stepped I, in, I feel like you just like stepped, you just into, stepped your into your name. Into a role, you like stepped into that so, Johnny yes, Austin. Yes, like you have, that, like, yeah. that's who you were meant to mm -hmm. be. It was difficult because what would happen then is then I'd go home, and this is one of the things that my therapist had to work with me on. It's fully becoming, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, again, in that position, I was a little lucky, actually, because when I walked in, I could just kind of shed everything, and it's not necessarily the healthiest. But it got me through it, and, and most of that's because I had a purpose. I had a team that I could work with, and people, and things that I was trying to do. And um, <laughs> it was, it, you know, that stupid bell on that elevator, man. I, I'm thankful for it today. But I mean, there was there was there was a lot of rough times where I didn't know if I was going to make it through that elevator, you know, mm. the next day or not. Um, but I think again, it goes back to God's grace and. Yeah. And knowing that there was a purpose, and the, the one thing that, that was nuts is people kept telling me, like, as, as the story got out, there's only a few people that knew during this whole time. And they all thought that I had a happy life. The podcast, in my podcast, I yell affirmations in the beginning. And for the first two years of our podcast, you'll hear, my kids know me as daddy and my wife knows me as the greatest husband alive. That was an aspiration of mine. Mm -hmm. And that was in, if you listen to all those, while I was going through the hardest time, because I was trying to be that. I was still yeah. trying to power through it and make it work. And um, it, it, what ended up happening in the, in the long run, there's a lot to this. Uh, there's a lot to this. But what ended up happening in the long run is I, I really did try. And um, I ended up getting a, a therapist, counselor in the area. We could not get this counseling center to communicate with us. One of their things was for us to reconcile, or before they would consider reconciliation, was for communication to start happening. That's all I ever wanted. Just tell me what I did wrong so I can really fix it and work mm -hmm. on myself. And they, we, I didn't know who Britt's counselor was because they wouldn't tell me. I didn't know anything. So we literally wrote this document that allowed anybody at that counseling center to reach out to my counselor and have access to my personal files. They could talk to him, anybody. The janitor could have done it because I didn't know who her counselor was. Mm -hmm. So we opened it up to the entire like thing and the entire church. Just somebody communicate Let with me, me and let's work through this because I'm going to fight until the very end for my marriage because that's what I believed in. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that never came through. And it got to the point where the church provided an attorney, and I knew this was coming up as well. Um, I showed up uh, to work one day, and, and when I went out to my car, there was the, the divorce um, the paperwork on the seat of my car. 
Mm. And um, I instantly recognized, you know, the attorney was a former Five Points member. I know that they were recommended. I'm pretty sure she got that pro bono, um, which was difficult because now what am I supposed to do? You mm. know, she's got all this representation. Uh, luckily, when they applied for it, because uh, in the very beginning it was for split uh, parenting. And um, right before then, all this crazy stuff started coming out. Like, we found out that, she had to admit it before we went to court, like my, my second son, the one that has heart issues, she, she started drugging him with Adderall without my acknowledgement or knowledge whatsoever. So stuff like that started happening. And all this stuff started coming out. And um, it was... And then it was all used against me. Like, so she had to do that because he would have objected. Well, yes, I would have objected. He's he's eight years old. I mean, you know what I mean? Adderall in a heart problem. Well, not only that, no teacher that he ever had, had, nobody had ever recommended that he even need to be on this at this point in time. When she left, she decided to continue to try to homeschool them, and that didn't work very well. And she just couldn't handle them. Now, I loved having Joss in my home. I, I know it. I worked with the counselor on how to do uh, executive functions. So being able to help him through some of that stuff, he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily have all that mm -hmm. all the time now, right? And even though drugs can help some people in some situations, it's still a patch. At the end of the day, it's a lot better to learn how to deal with it and create an environment that's going to work for you, you mm -hmm. know? So... She, she gets the paperwork, I get the paperwork, and um, I mean, my life was up and down, my emotions were up and down. My, my therapist had told me that it was, like, it was like a battery for your phone, and it got drained down to zero, and then as soon as you get up to 40%, they would hit me with another thing, and it would get drained again. And because she had an attorney that she could just constantly turn to, like I was getting hit left and right. Mm. Um, at one point in time, they had suggested that I go to a um, uh, psychologist as well. And the psychologist had found that I was under so much stress that my brain or my body was secreting this chemical that deletes memories to protect itself. And they said I was under the same amount of stress that a, a rape victim goes under. So in order to protect itself, I was losing days. Like mm. I would go in and not know what day it was or what I did the days before. Yeah. And and they put me on medicine, and, and I, um, you know, who was they? The the, the 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 therapist recommended I go to the psychologist, okay. the psychologist, psychiatrist, whichever it is that subscribes. They, they they put me on medication, and I don't know what I was on. I can't remember, um, but I'll tell you this: that medicine made you stop feeling feelings. Mm. And I I took it for a week, and I remember a coworker I worked with, Mary Ellis. She just it was a Friday. She just made this comment. She goes, you know, you've kind of been off all week. And that really made me sit and think about mm. what was happening to me. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I would rather feel the worst pain in the world and still be able to feel happiness when it comes than, than to nothing. feel nothing at all. Yeah. And so I threw, I threw them away and I stopped taking it and I just started dealing with the lumps as life mm -hmm. blew. And my only concern now was... Is there still hope for me to get a message to my wife? And if not, which I'm pretty sure there wasn't, how can I make sure I keep my kids? So the day before we go in for the meeting with the kids, she submits 21 letters to the court system. What like is it 12 with hours. these letters? Oh my gosh. Because she had a whole church binder. And they knew. Finding everything. They knew that this was going to jack me up, and it did. I was at work, and Heather, this is the only time I couldn't keep it together at work. I was sitting at my desk, and I just got this email, and I, I couldn't control shaking, and I, I must have just, my face must have just blown up. And they, Heather comes and pulls me, she, goes, she pulls me into a side room, <laughs> and she says, uh, is everything okay? And I couldn't even talk, man. I was trying to get on with people as fast as possible. I was shaking, because I was like, this is it. Look at all this. My attorney started reading the letters, and she goes, dude, you're going to be okay. Have you read these? <laughs> they are things that are so petty from, you know, and now, again, they signed, hey, the church, you know, the children's minister, the woman's minister. But there were things like I put on Facebook one time that a gallon of poop water spilled on my floor because it did. I had a fish tank that, that the water spilled over one time, and I went and cleaned it. But they literally wrote a letter that said, "Kid, my boy should not be in my household because of this one post that I put." 
which is crazy. Or when I didn't know where my, my kids were at, um, you know, the her brother-in-law, who's a police officer, said, when I went through the household, there was a knife sitting up on the counter in the kitchen. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it was stuff What's like that. What's hot about that? And, uh, and, and her, her current landlord wrote a letter that said she keeps pristine, her property pristine and has over-improved on the property. So these were the things that got submitted. And I, but I lost it. I, I couldn't, I mean, I just lost it. Yeah. Luckily, when we showed up, the person that read that stuff, she 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 took it completely off the table. She said, "We're not going to talk about anything other than joint custody here. Everything else is off the table." And I was able to finally breathe. I felt for the first right. time, and uh, and she was the one that recognized what was going on. She tried making it as fair as possible because she realized that like I want that time with my boys. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm fighting for that time for that daily FaceTime and for all that stuff. So I won the best I could in a really losing situation when it come to getting my boys back. And I'll never forget the counselor came back on. I don't know what Britt said. But she said in the meeting, she said, you two need to love your kids more than you hate each other. And I said, I don't hate my wife. Mm. And they stopped me. They're like, you, ah, you can't talk, don't talk. and. Get with your attorney. You can't say stuff on the record and blah, blah, blah. You should be like, no, I want that on the record. <laughs> and, and I said, I was like, what was that? And so the time came for the divorce to actually happen. And um, this is something that Randy doesn't know either. At this time, Randy was letting me use his Mercedes van. My son calls it the handy dandy Randy mobile. <laughs> and I told, I told everybody that I was going to fight for this marriage until the very end. And I meant it. And I realized until the judge actually hit the gavel on the table, she was still my wife. And I had one last opportunity to talk to her as her husband. So I had made the decision that I was going to take that opportunity at our court case. And I recognized that the judge might not want me talking. And <laughs> they might hold me in attempt of court or whatever that's called. Contempt, contempt. contempt of court, thank you, yeah. So I was prepared for that. But because I had Randy's vehicle, I didn't want to get towed from the courthouse. So I asked my pastor and, and one of the board members of our church to come with me so that they could, one, bail me out, and two, take the van <laughs> if I needed them to. Uh, one thing I didn't realize because of COVID, this whole thing ended up happening over Zoom. Zoom. <laughs> Zoom. So... So you had like free range at that point. So did yeah, they shut so, your camera off? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we we jump into Zoom. Um, you know, my pastor said, "Why don't you come into our church?" And and he had people on the other side of the Zoom camera, and they stayed and prayed during the whole thing. And I got on with my attorney, who she was not a fan of me by the end because I kept making her take things out. Like you can't put in there that I want a divorce, so that I'm okay with that. You need to put in there that I believe in marriage and the sanctity. Like, I made her put my faith in there. That's who I am. Yeah. And she's like, well, we don't really do that. I'm like, no, you're going to do it. I'm not I'm not signing this, right? Mm -hmm. So so we get to the, the court case, and I told my attorney, I said, you need to say whatever you need to say to make sure that I can speak to my wife. She said, well, what are you going to say? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> she goes, okay. So they do their thing the judge is, is doing her thing and it's getting it's getting to the end and then and then my attorney finally says my client has a statement that he would like to make and the judge said well have you reviewed this statement <laughs> and she said no hell no <laughs> and the judge says well do you have it in writing and she said no and the judge went what's he going to talk about and she said it's religious and the judge paused and the judge went okay I guess and I don't know I don't remember all of what I said I have the transcript I, sh I should read it um, but I do know that I, I told Britt that she was loved the entire time she was loved and if she ever wanted to reconcile I was always there to reconcile with her that's that and I, and I told I told the court that people talk about love a lot but love is a supernatural act that happens mm -hmm. And that you can't just fall out of it because it's an action that you get to choose to continue to do or not. And when I was finished talking, I was very surprised the judge didn't cut me off. There's these three dashes in the official paperwork you'll see 
where the judge paused for a very long time and she said, Mr. Brines, I'm employed by the state of Michigan to uphold the laws of the state of Michigan. And unfortunately, I have to keep my religion out of this. And it was at this time that I realized, man, I must have struck a chord with this judge because mm -hmm. now she's making an excuse yeah. for what she has to do. And she said, and because of that, in Michigan, there's no, no fault or whatever they call that. So anybody can just apply. There's no reasoning behind it. And she said, so I will have to divorce you. And the craziest thing happened. She said, she said that. She said, however, the craziest thing has happened. <laughs> Somehow, your entire file has gone missing from our system. Like our entire thing. And she goes, I'm going to have to get on the tech people for this and figure out what happened. But the, your entire file has just disappeared. And my pastor and the guy in the background are like, Jesus, you know, it's not your hand. They're like, gotcha, right? And she said, your attorneys are going to have to rewrite everything. And when they do and get it back to me, I will sign this. But I always thought, like, that was one of those, those cool moments. little moments. moments. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that moment was as much for me as it was to pause to say, listen, this whole side was against our marriage. Maybe they get this one last chance to soak in what was said mm -hmm. and think about what was happening. And it was really interesting because it's this, it really is this good versus evil story in the end because while my church was sitting there praying against it, her church opened the doors for her to be comfortable, and that's where she sat to divorce me inside she was of her okay church. With it. Not only was she okay with it, the church the was church okay was with okay that. The church was okay with it, yeah. yeah. A divorce happened inside of their doors. Yeah. So yeah. that all ended. And when that ended, the section in there about name change was entered. And that was when I got my name. Oh. Johnny Awesome. Yeah. So that uh that is uh that is a long story about yeah. how I got to that. No, but I can, feel wait, like wait, 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 can we clap to the victory? I know, yeah. like so. I like because I don't think you would be like, like that's the you, victory of the whole situation. You are Johnny Awesome. Yeah. And yeah. like and, and even that's when I told that, like William wasn't there when we came to Free For All and I and I did tell him a little bit about like what we were gonna talk about and stuff like that. And I was like, but his name is legally Johnny Austin. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, what? Like, yeah. he's like, but no, listen. no, it's not. No, it is. But you are Johnny Awesome. Like, yeah. I, I, and yeah. I think that the testimony to where you've become Johnny Awesome, that's why I said when we mm. talked about it, when Brooke and I first started, like, I'm like, you were right. Like, there was a whole story behind what made you Johnny Awesome. And, and at Free For All, your four boys were there yeah. when we were doing the interview when you were being dad and we were just kind of laughing it off and they were being normal yeah. boys. And it was, Ish. but it was so great to see because you, you were with your boys. Yeah. I, and it was awesome. It's, and the story, the story is, gonna, is to be continued. There's two things that I'm working on right now. One is um, I'm working on a book called The Response. And it is an actual response to the letter that the church submitted mm. to my church. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm been pulling resources together to get that together. And as, as somebody that still very much thinks of himself as a realtor, you know that's <laughs> never going to get done in, <laughs> for, in the near future anyway. But, um, but I have enough resources with people that I know that can push me along to do that. The second to be continued that most people don't know about is this right here, which is very important. I've been um, looking at that. So, well, it's yeah. funny because I don't know if you remember, I said something about that at Free For All. Yeah. And I said something about your wife and you're like, God bless her or something like that. Because I saw your tattoo. Oh, yeah. got the B. Yeah, so yeah. There, that's a B for Brit. And it faces me. And it's teal mm. because that's her favorite color. And a lot of people ask, like, why aren't you getting that removed? Or are you going to get that removed? And this is probably my favorite. This is my favorite tattoo that I have. And it doesn't seem like that makes sense. But this, to me, is integrity. And it showed my commitment to do exactly what I said I was going to do right up until the very end. I tried. And I think it's going to be a beautiful story when my new wife, 
who I'm looking for, by the way, I'm not on every social platform. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, let him know what social. Yeah, so zoom in, real quick. I, I, I actually do like long walks on the beach. Uh, <laughs> but I think it'll be the, uh, I think it'll be great because of two reasons. Um, no matter who my next wife will be, she will legally now also be awesome, mm -hmm. and she will oh, be able to. So <laughs> yes, it's great. This is awesome. This is awesome. That's a great name. And, it is, uh, right? But more important than that is going to be the symbolism of when she takes that ring mm. and covers all the pain mm. that I went through here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be such a beautiful moment mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm really, really waiting for. Um, and, then, uh, and then the story will then continue. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the day, um, you know, the one thing that I think made me through the, get me through it, and there was one point where I, I didn't think that I was gonna, I think I told you guys mm -hmm. the story, um, I had a gun in my mouth at one point in time. And mm -hmm. if it wasn't for the fact that I hated the taste of gun oil, and it mm -hmm. grossed me out and I spit it out before I could even think to do anything wrong, it gave me enough time to think, you know what I mean? Um, but there was so, the rest of the time I just kept thinking to myself, if I'm going to go through this and go through this pain, there's going to be a reason at the end of the day. And this story that I have, if I can help one other person mm -hmm. out there go, man, if he can make it every single day, just scratch a little bit better and get one more day, maybe I can too. Yeah. Then everything I went through, although hard, was worth it. And that's really what's keeping me going right now. And that's really why I want to thank you guys. It's the first time I really opened up as deep. I didn't open up this deep on my podcast about this stuff. Um, it's time for me to start getting the yeah. story out. It's it time is. for that purpose to really start living. It is. Yeah. Thank you um, for. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thank you no, for being fun. vulnerable on our podcast. And I do want to say, you know, when I met Johnny, he was going through this, and I had no idea. Like I was mm -hmm. a new realtor, and Johnny was coming in teaching me how to be a real estate agent. And I would have never known he had a smile on his face, like you said, when he came out. I used to throw home. confetti everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Were you there when I used to throw confetti? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but That's awesome, yeah. Yeah. I, I have two things. Yeah. Say. So my first, my first thing is, um, I think your name, Johnny Awesome, I think the fact of that being your name, I feel like that actually in a way got you through that because you were able to step into being that person yeah and in doing all of that you even you helped other people and mm -hmm. even going through everything you were going through because even like brooke said she didn't even realize yeah so you were still able to help other people so i just wanted to encourage you to keep telling your story because even in helping people not unknowingly imagine how many people that you can help you know knowingly mm -hmm. so i just wanted to give you that part and the second thing is i think you should stop calling that a church well, and start calling it a cult, cult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i'm just gonna say that on camera because that's what it is yeah it, it was never a point where you brought up anything about them saying anything about the Bible. Yeah. It was like always these letters or this or that. Like, that's not a church, in yeah. my opinion. And I'm just going to say that because you can. this is the realest people in real estate. Really? Exactly. Because you can, and we can. So that's, that's my piece. But I applaud you. Yeah. I applaud your strength. And, you know, just keep going and keep telling your story. Yeah. I, I guess I'll, I'll finish us off. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for coming you on so here much. and telling your story. And um, I can't wait for everyone to hear it. Yeah. Honestly, Johnny, like, I cannot wait because yeah. you are here to do great things. Mm -hmm. And I mean that. Well, thank yeah. you. And, and like I said at the very beginning, I, I think God, everything happens for a reason. And the fact that you guys asked me when you did and the date that it comes out, I, this is, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. So uh, thank you for being a... The stepping, not, I don't want to say stepping stone, but the catalyst, I should say, mm -hmm. um, for allowing me to share this publicly uh, and learn to be vulnerable. <laughs> mm. It's hard, man. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Learn it's hard. to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's, that's what I've been doing the last when you year. Grow. That's when you grow. <laughs> and that's when we grow. So, mm -hmm. bro, you want to close us out on that note? Yeah, so thank you guys for tuning back in to the Realest People in Real Estate podcast. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you in the next one. 
Peace. Peace.